Well, the Supreme Court, uh, the other shoe dropped. This uh, McCutcheon uh, versus the FCC is sort of the other half of Citizens United. The uh, Citizens United had left intact what are called aggregate campaign limits or, or contribution limits um, that you could you can give money to politicians directly to their campaigns, and there are limits on that amount, and those are left intact in McCutcheon. Um, and, but in aggregate, you can't give more than roughly 123000 I think it was 123200 dollars to, in other words, you couldn't, if you were rich enough, like the Koch brothers, they just, I mean, you know, they made over $10 billion last year um, it, or over the last decade. If you were to just simply say, I'm going to give the maximum limit or I'm just going to buy every politician in America, you can't do that. There's an aggregate limit of 123000 and change. And the Supreme Court struck that down. And uh, that announcement came out today. The lawyer for Sean McCutcheon, and uh, a Republican uh, activist and Alabama-based engineer, uh, the lead the lead attorney in this case, arguing before the United States Supreme Court, was a fellow by the name of Dan Backer. Uh, he is a the founder and principal attorney with DB Capital Strategies. The website is dbcapitalalstrategies.com. And Dan is on the line with us. Hey, Dan, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you for having me. I uh, just want to make two quick corrections. Please. Uh, one is. The um, the website actually works with whether it's T-A-L or T-O-L. We have a weird technical thing we're trying to fix. And I actually didn't argue the case in front of the Supreme Court. We had uh, the very capable Erin Murphy, who used to clerk for Justice Roberts. Uh, we were able to co get her to be our, our oral advocate. And as somebody who knew the, the, the mind of the, the Chief Justice, it was a phenomenal opportunity. And so she argued the case for uh, Mr. McCutcheon and the RNC. Oh, that, that sounds like a very, very good strategy. You were the lead attorney, however, though. You, you helped put together the arguments. Yes, I'd like to say that I'm probably not the architect of the case, but I am the general contractor. I, uh, I've been Sean's political counsel since before the case uh, was a surprise. And uh, he and I, uh, I, I've been through the FEC, the district court, and uh, ultimately the Supreme Court. Right. So in the in the dissent, this was a five to four decision, and in the dissent, they didn't even refer to the majority, I, it, which says to me that there's really some bad, bad blood forming here between the 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 five uh, conservative justices and the four more liberal justices. Um, in in the dissent, they said in making this argument, the plurality uh, relies heavily upon a narrow def definition of corruption that excludes efforts to obtain influence over or access to elected officials or political parties. In other words, um, the argument that uh, Justices uh, Roberts, Kennedy, Alito, Thomas, and who am I missing, Scalia, uh, made was that uh, just because you give a lot of money to a politician um, and just because that causes them to give you access to them, uh, that that's not necessarily corruption. Uh, do I have that right? Yeah, I believe that's a, a fair way of putting it. Um, okay, so how is that not corruption? Because the Supreme Court has defined the only the only justification for interfering with political speech as quid pro quo corruption. It's not corruption as some general nebulous concept. It's a very specific form of corruption. No, I, I understand that. And you're and giving me as something in your official duties. No, I, I understand that, Dan. Duties. And okay. and. And, and um, you know, the Supreme Court has also said in, in Dred Scott that people are property. I mean, the Supreme Court has said a lot of things over the years that when we look back on, we say, those guys were fools. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would argue even that, that uh, Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided, that they were basically making law rather than deciding law. And, uh, you know, this is, this is judicial activism and judicial review on steroids. But just... From, for practical purposes, and there's countries all over the world that struggle with this. You know, in the U.K., for example, there's a 100,000-pound limit on how much money can be spent on a campaign, so campaigns typically don't run more than about four weeks. Um, other countries do it in other ways, um, but most developed democracies have some way of keeping billionaires and multinational corporations, or in our case, you know, for example, the bin Laden family, uh, from buying politicians. And the Supreme Court seems to have knocked out all of those limitations. That's what? simply not the case. Okay. Uh, right on its face. 
the bin Laden, foreign donors may not contribute to American political activity in any way, shape, or form. It's already but happened. Do not, well, it's, it's happening, happening on, it's constantly. They, they set up American subsidiaries, and, and, the, and they make large donors. It happened in the last election. Well, corporations cannot make contributions directly to candidates either. Only they do it through PACs, which, well, we, again, a, a, a loophole that was but, opened but, by this Supreme uh, Court. Do you want to answer your question or not? I'm going to give you the answer that sure. you obviously don't want to hear, but I'm giving you the answer. Corporations may not legally contribute. Corporations may raise money from their restricted class employees, which is a very narrow universe of individuals in any given corporation or a union membership or trade association membership. They can raise money from those people and contribute those hard dollars. Uh, but that is not the same as saying, well, you know, GE just cut me a check for 50,000 or for 50 grand. It's amount, there's a limitation on the amount that may come from the PAC to any of those candidates. And there's a limitation that can go into that pack from a very narrow universe. Now, it's really easy to just go and say, well, I don't care. I don't like it because it doesn't look right to me. But there's a fundamental difference here. My right to free speech, your right to free speech and free assembly is intrinsic to you. It is your right. And the government doesn't give it to you. You have it to begin with. And so when the government comes in and tries to regulate around that right, as it may do, it must do so in the narrowest, most carefully constructed means possible. And to so protect the public, public welfare, and hmm? to, pr to protect the public welfare, or as yeah, Justice yeah, Stevens yeah, said, in, in fact, it is not in, to protect the public welfare. That is not a ground that the Supreme Court has recognized to to limit your constitutional right to speech and assembly. Put it this way: you have a radio show; you're allowed to get on the air and say whatever you want. But what if uh, actually I'm the not? Government came in, and well, yes, the government limits your use of certain profanity and penalized for it. What if the government came in and sat in your newsroom and said? You know, you're not doing enough stories about this topic. You need to do this, or we're going to revoke your license. That's not what we're talking about here. Speech. What we're right. talking about here That's exactly is... what we're talking no, about No, what here. we're talking about here is whether money is protected in the First Amendment, because that's the core of this thing. That was the core of Buckley, and, and arguably this decision even knocked down Buckley. But that was the core of Buckley. This decision clearly says on its face over and over again, we are, we are maintaining the Buckley standard. No, they said that... It, they said that we we don't actually twice they said we don't need the Buckley standard in in, in particular uh, examples. I mean, but but even even yeah. if they're maintaining the but Buckley standard, the Buckley standard was still asserting that money was protected within boundaries by the by the First Amendment as speech. And I'm I'm suggesting that that is fallacious. That that on its face is wrong. And I why should you're, why, why your should the, is inaccurate. Why should Sean McCutcheon, because he's a multimillionaire, have more speech than me? Why should Sean McCutcheon, because he's a multimillionaire, have some of his rights denied to him because you don't have the same rights? Well, you're, you're saying that it's a right. I'm, I'm not saying that it's a right to spend money. Yes, it is. It is a right to contribute to political candidates. Well, it is according to the Supreme Court. But why? According to the uh, Supreme Court 40 years ago in Buckley v. Vallejo, it's according to every single Supreme Court ruling that touched on this. There's a constitutional right to speech and association, and money is the only practical means by which individuals may speak and potentially speak and associate. It is absolutely your right to do so. And even, with all due respect, even the dissent is not saying you don't have a right to make contributions. What they're arguing is, what the dissent has argued, is that contributions are, are subject to some different standard of corruption than has been the set of law for the, at least the last several years, and frankly goes back to Buck D.D. Vallejo. Well, no, I understand that, and 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 in fact, it, I would I would refer you to Stevens's dissent dissent in in Citizens United, where he said, you know, the most corrupting influence on our democracy of this is going to be that people are going to assume that everybody's bought off, and they're not going to participate in the democratic process. The most corrupting influence our, in our democracy is government that is over-regulating and encouraging people to participate in, uh, in, in ways that you apparently don't like. But, you know, I, yeah. I get that you don't like this ruling, but it's still perfectly in accordance with the law. Well, and Dan, you won the case. So, you know, congratulations on that. Dan, Dan Backer, dbcapitalstrategies.com. Thanks, Dan, for dropping by. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Sure. This is the Tom Hartman Program. So what possible alternative could there be if the Supreme Court asserts positively that money is protected by the First Amendment?